Hello, my name is Stephen Fluin, and this is Demos with Angular. Today we're watching a third part in a series that I've been doing all about building a turnip exchange for the Switch game Animal Crossing New Horizons. Now, the last two sessions that we've done have actually been live streamed where we got into trouble, we figured out things that were broken, we had to file bugs, we had to follow up, we had to really grind through the process of figuring things out. And I knew that the next couple stages of the project were gonna be even more experimental than that. So we're doing something a little bit different with this video. What we're doing is I'm just gonna be walking you through all the changes I've made to the project over the last couple of days. And we're gonna be ignoring all of the mistakes I made, all the problems that I had along the way, because it's not really a lot of fun to watch me for an hour or two reading API documentation, trying things, and like doing off by one errors in my tries and catches. So we're just going to be going through the code that I've written in the last day and talking about the functions and the effect that it had on the product. So let's go ahead and dive in. So if you take a look at the GitHub repository for the project, uh, you're going to see I've made a few commits here. So the first thing that I did was that I wanted to go ahead and add Firebase functions. And so if you remember where we left off, we had this very nice Firebase integrated database where you could authenticate, you could edit an island. Uh, but then what we really want to do is we wanted to start adding uh, a set of additional APIs because one of the fundamental problems with this turnip exchange is you don't want to be sharing your Dodo code, the uh, code that gives anyone access to your island until they've actually hit the right position in the queue. And so we can't just use a naive Firebase list that anyone can query. So we uh, have to do it a little bit more intelligently. So what we're doing is instead we're building an API on top of Firebase where that API has complete access to the entire database but individual users do not have access to the entire database. So we're actually having a couple APIs. You could have theor theoretically built this API on top of any backend database. Uh, we're not actually using some of the features of the real-time database, but let's go ahead and take a look at what we did. So uh, in the project, I ran uh, Firebase init functions, and what that did is it created a whole new folder for me. So let's take a look at that. So if we take a look here, let's close that console. We now have at the very, very root of our project, a functions folder. Now I chose to create that functions with TypeScript, which I definitely recommend for everyone. And so it gave you a whole new package, JSON, tsconfig, tslint, all those sorts of things. Uh, and then at the heart of it, it gave you an index.ts file. So normally what you would do is in this index.ts file, you would export all of the functions that you need for your project. But one of the things that I discovered was that we can't actually um, be parsing the data that's coming in, you can't actually have like a post request through a default naive uh, Firebase function. So in order to actually take advantage of a uh, course headers library, things like that, I had to actually use Express. And so what I did is I'm exposing a single Firebase function that uses Express to handle routing. And so if we take a look at index.ts, we're gonna see a whole bunch of things. So I'm pulling in from Firebase functions, which is gonna give me the methods I need to actually register the single function that I have, I'm pulling in from Firebase admin because that's what I would need to actually access the real-time database. I'm pulling in from cores because I want to allow post requests and I want to ignore any cores problems that we have when I'm pulling from one domain or another. And we also are pulling in express. So if we take a look at the heart of this, we have a express application here. So app equals express. We're uh, saying use cores. So we're going to ignore any uh, pre-flight options requests and we're going to say these are allowed and we're going to respond with the correct response which will then allow the browser to make that post request and then i'm doing just a kind of a normal express setup here using nodes so you've got app.get for my get calls you've got uh, app.post for post calls etc and then at the bottom is the magic where the firebase function is being wrapped up uh, wrapping up that express application so we've got request app so that all works pretty, pretty well. I've left in some comments here accidentally here. Uh, and what I've done is I've actually gone and I've created a bunch of different APIs. So let's take a look at these in the order that I wrote them. So the first thing that I did was uh, I did a whole bunch of experimentation because I needed to be doing user authentication from the client side to the real-time database. And the way that you do this is you need your client side application to send over the token from Firebase. And so there's a couple different ways I get this, but in general, what I did is I created an auth service so that we can just subscribe to this a single time globally for my entire application. And then I subscribe to the user. So whenever the user is valid, I'm actually then uh, doing a promise to get ID token so I can get the user's auth token. Because 
when I pass that back into the Firebase function, just via normal HTTP GET or POST call, I can then call this verify token method that I wrote. So if we take a look at this code, it's a really, really simple method. And what we do is we take in a request, just as a helpful thing, you could have actually gotten this, you could have passed in that token, but I wanted to get it directly from the request body or the request query. And then what you do is you call admin.auth verify ID token. And what that's going to get you back, if we look at the type, is it's going to give you a promise of a decoded ID token. So if we look at the most basic function that I have, which is this uh, queue method, where this is if a user wants to add themselves to a queue of an island. So I want to go visit Jeremy's island, so I'm going to visit his, or I'm going to click on his island, and then I'm going to say, add me to the queue. And what it's going to do is it's going to send my token over, and that's going to verify that I actually am adding myself, my own user ID, uh, to the queue because if we didn't verify the user's UID, I could just go in and put any UID in there. I could put in other people's ID. I could edit other people's ID, all those sorts of things. So we're trying to be very, very mindful of security here. There might be a gap that I missed, but I think overall I've done things pretty correctly. So we do this verification, which gives us a decoded ID. Uh, excuse me, a, a decoded token, which actually includes a couple things. And the thing that I'm using is I'm using the decoded UID. So what I can do is when the user tries to add themselves to a queue, I make sure they're a valid user, they're signed in, and then I get access to the database. I find this, I, I've created a bunch of new paths within my Firebase database, one called user and one called private. The idea is a user can see and edit anything within their user key, uh, and private is only going to be used by the back end because we don't actually want, again, any of this data to leak out to users unless they have the right permissions. And so we're going to access the private section of my Fire type, Firebase real-time database only through that fi uh, private key. So we've got private slash queues slash destination. And then we need to push into that uh, list both the name of the user and the UID. I think later I'm going to need to switch out user, uh, which is right now coming from uh, the user's display name from the Google sign-in and actually need to put in their character ID because otherwise it's hard to match up uh, a user or a person that's trying to join your island with the character that's going to show up on your island. Uh, and then we were just sending back a kind of uh, acknowledgement and anytime there's an error in any of these promises or any of this asynchronous code, I'm just going to be sending a status 500 so that we can go debug that both on the client and the server. So with that, uh, I built out a queue and then I could add myself to the queue. If we take a look at what this actually looks like, uh, we can go to someone's island. So I'll just go to Jeremy's island here. Uh, and I was actually already in the queue, so we'll clean that out. So I hit the queue button. I am now in the queue. And so if we take a look at what this actually looks like within Firebase, I'll just pull that up quick. And we'll pull up the specific turnip project here. In our real-time database, we are going to see that we have this slash private key where we've got this queue and there's no one in it right now. Oh, there it is. His, his uh, user ID, I think, was ABC for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, but as I modify this, so as I add myself, remove myself from the queue, that should be updating. So when I leave the queue, that's all deleted. When I queue, there it goes again. So. The island name, again, is ABC right now just because we hard coded it. If you actually went and created your own island, you'd only be able to create an island with your own user ID. So that's just an artifact of the, some of the testing data. Um, we should see that if I go into my own island and queue myself. So there we go. We've got my user ID, and then we've got this ordered list of people that are wanting to visit. Uh, and as you saw, the next thing I did is I went and built a status message. So uh, based on our little API requirements document that we wrote together, uh, we had this idea that you could have a single method where slash island slash ID slash status is going to get you the status of the island for you based on your context. And so there's actually a few different states that this can be in. So you're either not queued or you're just in a position where you can't actually see the ID, right? If you're user number 40 in the queue, we don't want you to see that secret code. Um, but if you are under position three, then we want you to set dodo code. And it's actually your chance and your turn to go and join the island. Um, the only other thing that you can see from this uh, island status, and the way, one way that we overloaded it a little bit more, was I made it so that if you are the owner of the island, you actually get back that entire queue so that you can manage it. So if we take a look at how we did that, we've got the same sort of setup where we get the parameters, we uh, verify the user's token to make sure we actually know who they are, because um, it would be bad if a user could see that token, because it's the name, of, it's the ID of the island, but then they went and just said, I'm 
first in the queue or whatever. So we're checking to see who they are. And then we are actually accessing that queue and we're either sending it back to them kind of relatively raw if they're the island owner. Uh, but if they are not, right, if the uh, UID we've determined is not the same as the island we're looking at, then they're a visitor. And then we can go and look and see, okay, where are they in the queue? We can just count out those positions and we can say they're either ready or not ready or if they're not queued. And so what we do is on the front end, we take this status that we're getting back and we actually render that out to the screen. So if we take a look again at Jeremy's Island, uh, we can see this is ready. If I left the queue, I would be not queued at all. Um, but if we go to, for example, my island, and let's just add a few people into the queue. So again, it lets me queue myself multiple times, which we shouldn't let uh, that happen in a real app. And then we take this uh, separate browser profile session. So this is a different user. Uh, we can see the queue is seven. I'm not in the queue right now, but as soon as I join the queue, I'm in queue position eight, uh, but I can't actually access it. So if we remove the other users, hey, I'm within number three. So it's my turn to access the queue. So now I can see it's actually my turn to join. I can see that secret code that no one else can see. None of the visibility rules give it to me unless I'm at the correct position in the queue. Uh, then what I did is I went and I built a few more functions. Uh, so the other functions are all related to this idea of removal from the queue. So there's two conditions where you can be removed from a queue. Uh, the first is if you put yourself in the queue, right? If I said, hey, Jeremy, I want to come to your island, then uh, if I'm in that uh, queue, I can go and remove myself. So we say if my queue matches the ID of the user, then I can remove myself. Or we actually let, uh, we again overload this method. So if you're an owner of an island, uh, you, uh, if you actually own the island, then we can let you remove any user from that queue. So I can say, hey, this person never connected or this person finished and didn't uh, resolve themselves. So all those things allow me to remove that person from that private queue. Uh, and then we have a couple debugs if we can't look up anything. Uh, so with that, we actually have most of the basics of the functionality. Obviously there's a lot of polish to go, but the idea that I can be in a queue, I can see the status, I can manage my queue, uh, I can share prices all of the basic functionality is here. So I think the two remaining sessions that I want to do, one is around reputation and another is around polish. I'm not sure which one we're going to do first, but we're actually getting pretty close to this application working. So I'm very excited to share the kind of the progress so far. And every week, Sunday, the uh, turnip season starts again. So hopefully we can get this done either by next Sunday or the following Sunday so that we can actually try out this app. We can beta it with a bunch of users and hopefully it adds some value to folks. So that's going to be it for the Turnip app tonight. That's part three. Uh, thank you so much for watching and uh, stay tuned for part four in a little bit. Thanks. Have a great night.